Well, I want to start out this morning with a little bit of audience participation, okay? So I'm going to say Merry Christmas, and I want you to muster up your best Merry Christmas as well, okay? So I'm going to say it to you, and then I want you all to say it back to me. You ready? I'm going to give you a moment. Just take a deep breath if you need to. Kind of get your lungs full of some air. Maybe wake up. Maybe poke the person next to you if they've already started to fall asleep, all right? So here we go. You ready? Merry Christmas. There we go. I love that. Thank you so much. Uh, you guys just, you touched my heart, so thank you. Uh, but th- seriously, thank you so much for being here and worshiping with us this morning. I'm sure that many of you have had already some exciting things that have taken place this morning, and most of us have a lot of other activities to, to go on throughout the rest of the day. But I really just want to thank you for taking time and being here this morning and worshiping with us. If you're a part of our online community this morning, thanks for joining us uh, that way as well. But just carving out some time where we can come together as this family and just have this family gathering this morning and just worship here on Christmas morning. So thank you so much for being here. You know, we've been in this uh, preaching series over the last few weeks that we've been calling Christmas in a Word, where we've just been putting a word to our Christmas season. And this morning's word is the word amazed. And I want us to read the narrative in Luke chapter 2 of the birth of Jesus. I think it's appropriate for us to do that on Christmas morning. I know we read it last night, but I want to read it again this morning. And so we're going to start at verse 1, and we're going to read down through verse 20. And we're going to see this word amazed pop up in our verses as we're uh, kind of going through it together this morning, all right? And so uh, let's just go to Luke 2, and uh, I'm going to start at uh, verse 1. And we're going to read down through verse 20. And somebody, I think, came up here and played a joke on me this morning. Uh-huh. I'm going to find out who that is before it's all over. <clears throat> I love our team. I love our team. I love our team. <laughs> but let's start at verse 1. We're going to read down through verse 20 here in Luke chapter 2. All right? Here we go. Luke says, in those days. So in other words, this is a real event that takes place. Okay? This is not some fairy tale. This is not some made-up story. Uh, This actually happened. Luke doesn't say once upon a time. He says in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Now, this manger is like this crude trough that's used to feed animals. And tradition tells us that this took place inside a stable. And a stable back in uh, Joseph and Mary's day would have been this dark and dirty cave, all right? Now, after Jesus is born, look at what happens. Luke says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. Now, if you dig into what the angel says there in the original language, you discover that that literally could be translated, stop fearing this great fear. So there's this emphasis there to help us understand that like the shepherds are freaking out right about now, okay? because this angel is, is, is visiting them. In fact, Luke says that they're terrified. And so... The angel says, stop fearing this great fear. I bring you good news that will cause great joy. That word for great really could be translated as mega. I bring you good news that will cause mega joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. I think this is really interesting here, okay? I want you to notice that the shepherds, they make the decision on their own to go into Bethlehem and check this all out. When the angel visits them, the angel doesn't tell them to go into Bethlehem. When you've got this heavenly host of angels that comes, they don't make a command for the shepherds to go uh, into Bethlehem. So they make this decision on their own. The angel just says, if you go check it out, here's what you're going to find. And so they're the ones who decide to go and look. Verse 16. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told him about this child. And all who heard it were amazed. There's our word for this morning. 
They were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So the angel brings this good news that will cause this great joy, this mega joy. The angel says, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. The shepherds, they go on their own and they check out Jesus. And then they begin to tell all the people around them what they have seen and what they've heard. And the text says that everyone is amazed. And so what I want to do this morning is I want us to spend just a few moments before we get on with the other activities of the day. And I want us to take some time, and I want us to just be amazed this morning, all right? Now, when you came in today, if you grabbed one of our bulletins on the back, there's some space where you can fill in some blanks, take some notes if you'd like to do that. If you have the RCC app, you can do that there as well, all right? So let's just spend a few moments. Let's just be amazed this morning. First of all, let's be amazed that Jesus is the Savior, the angel says that Jesus is the Savior. You know, every year, these things just cause us this inexpressible joy. Am I right? I'm being a little sarcastic here, actually. Because when you get, <laughs> because when you get these things out, first of all, you've got to get them untangled, kind of like I'm trying to do tonight. And I don't know how it is, or this morning, and I don't know how it is at your house, but at our house, we... You know, we go to like these painstaking efforts to, to, to kind of wrap these things up and make them all nice and neat. And it doesn't matter how hard we try. When we open up the storage bins the next year, they're just all kind of messed up for whatever reason. And it's hard to get them untangled sometimes. But the real joy comes when you get the tree up and it's time to put these things on the tree and you plug them in and nothing, right? I mean, they, they worked the year before. But somehow, for whatever reason, just by being in a storage bin for a year, you get them out the next year and you plug them in, and they don't work. I'll tell you what happened to us last year. We decorated our tree, and about three or four days after we were done decorating the tree, one of the strands of lights went out in the middle. And so we had this dark spot on the tree. Now, let me tell you something. There's no amount of joy that you can have when one of these strands of light goes out after you've decorated the entire thing, right? I was reading this past week about... Uh, two families who were competing against one another to have the Guinness World Record for using the most bulbs at Christmas time to decorate your house. And there was a family in Australia that used 331,000 bulbs, and they held the record for 10 years. And then there was a family in New York who decided that they were going to outdo that family, and so they used over 350,000 lights. Well, the next year, the, the, the family in Australia, they used 500,000 lights. Well, not to be outdone, the next year, the family in New York, they used over 600,000 lights to decorate their house at Christmas time. Now, I counted, on this strand of lights right here, I've got 40 lights. So I just did a little bit of math. And if I want to have 600,000 uh, Christmas lights then what that means is, is I've, or I've got to have 15,000 strands of lights, and I've got to have, uh, that comes to about 150,000 feet, because uh, this is 10 foot of lights right here, and 150,000 feet comes to 28.4 miles of lights. I've got to be honest, that doesn't sound like fun at all. <laughs> but I thought it was interesting, I did have to kind of laugh at the end of, uh, at the, end of the article, this New York family said this. They said, we're thrilled to bring the world record back to the United States. Now, somewhere along the way, these two families lost the original meaning of Christmas. Go back to our text. Look at verses 10 and 11. The angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. This is the true meaning of Christmas. A Savior has been born. In fact, it's the foundation of our faith. God gave us exactly what we needed. We needed a Savior. You know, the Bible tells us that all of us sin, that all of us fall short of the expectations that God has for us, that all of us do things that go against what He wants for us. In the Old Testament, look at what David wrote. <clears throat> Excuse me. He said, The fool says in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. And so David says there's no one who seeks God. There's no one who does good. I mean, understand, it's not like that there are some who seek God, there are some who do good, and God just doesn't see them. David says, God looks down on us here, and there's no one who seeks him. There's no one who does good. And so listen, friends, sin touches every area of our lives. 
and we deserve God's eternal anger and judgment for our sin. But because Jesus is our Savior, we can be saved from that eternal anger and that judgment. We don't have to be punished for our sin. We can, we can go from facing this eternal anger and judgment to having this hope of being with him forever. Look at what Paul says about Jesus. This is one of my favorite verses. He says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I mean, think about this for a second, okay? Without Jesus, we don't stand a chance, do we? And so Jesus comes as our Savior because we needed a Savior. In fact, I want you to think about this for just a second, okay? Because Jesus is our Savior, he transforms us from who we are to who we need to be. He transforms me from who I am. I am a sinner. I, I, I have this, this hopeless life. I, I have eternal separation from God. I have hell to look forward to, right? And so he transforms me from this sinner where I, I have this eternal anger and this eternal judgment from God. And then he transforms me into one who has this incredible hope of eternal life with him. And so we're transformed from who we are to who we need to be, and it's all through Jesus. And this eternal life is only found in Jesus. John said it like this. He said, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. How many of you are thankful for that this morning, that eternal life is found in Jesus? I love the clarity of God's word. I mean, God's word makes it clear. Eternal life is only found through Jesus. You know, you may be ashamed of many things, and you may, be, you may feel guilty for many of the things that you've done, but Jesus gave his life for you, and you can have this eternal life because it's found in Jesus. He is our Savior. Look at what Peter says in Acts 4. Talking about Jesus, he says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Friends, God loves you, and he sent his son to give his life for you, to save you, to rescue you from your sin. And there's no other name under heaven given by which we must be saved, because he is our savior. And so we can be amazed this morning. We're amazed that he is our savior. Let's also be amazed that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Messiah. As the angel makes this announcement to the shepherds, he's identifying who Jesus is. And he tells the shepherds that Jesus is the Messiah. Go back to verse 10 again. It says, the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. And so Jesus is the Messiah. And the word that's used here for the Messiah means that Jesus is the anointed one. He's the chosen one. So in other words, Jesus was sent by the Father to be a king and to deliver us from sin. And so as our Savior, he, he saves us, he rescues us from our sin. As the Messiah, he sets us free from our sin. He sets us free from the power of our sin. He sets us free from the punishment of our sin. Sets us free from the penalty uh, of our sin. And what I want to make sure you understand is that when Jesus is born on that night in Bethlehem, he's coming for you and he's coming for me. You know, when Jesus is born in Bethlehem, the people are looking for the Messiah. The people back in Jesus' day, they were looking for a Messiah. But they believed that the Messiah was going to come and set up this political kingdom. I mean, they believed that the, that the Messiah was coming for the government. That he was going to set Israel free from Roman rule. And so the people are looking for this political king, this political Messiah. But the Messiah that's described in the Old Testament doesn't come to set up a political kingdom. He comes to set up a spiritual kingdom. And so when Jesus is born and he's the Messiah, even though the people are looking for him, most of them, they miss him because Jesus comes to do something completely different than what, he, what they think he's coming to do. I remember several years ago, my wife Marianne, she has an elementary education degree and she has her teaching, a teaching license through the state of Oklahoma. And there for a while, we were renewing her license every year. And I remember one year it was time to renew her license and we looked everywhere for her license and we couldn't find that thing. I mean, we, we tore the house apart. We looked for like three or four days. We were looking for this white envelope that had her teacher's license inside of it. And after like three or four days, after we had just torn the house completely apart, I went back to the filing cabinet, to the drawer where it was supposed to be. We'd looked there like three or four times already and I just started pulling everything out individually. And finally, I got about halfway through the drawer, and I pulled out this manila envelope. And I opened it up, and inside it was her teacher's license. I mean, it was right there in front of us the entire time, but we missed it because we were looking for something different. We were looking for a white envelope and not a manila envelope. 
And when Jesus is born, the people are looking for the Messiah, but they miss him because they're looking for something completely different. I mean, Jesus himself proclaims that he is the Messiah. In Luke 4, Jesus goes to the synagogue there in Nazareth, and when he stands up to read, here's what Luke tells us happens. Look at what he says. He says, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it's written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. You know, every time I read this here in Luke 4, and I get to this point, I always wonder if like Jesus makes this really dramatic pause. Because Luke says that, you know, everybody's eyes are fastened on Jesus. So it's almost like, you know, there's this intensity in the room. Like like it's so tense you could just cut the air with a knife. Luke goes on. Luke says, he began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus says, I am the Messiah. And so Jesus didn't come to set them free from the Romans, but he came to set them free from sin. And Jesus didn't come to be a political king, but he came to be the king of our hearts. And it's through his death and resurrection that we're set free from sin, and we have this relationship with the Father. Only the Messiah could accomplish this for us. You know, Jesus makes it clear throughout his life and ministry that he came for sinners. In Luke 19, Jesus says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. In Mark 2, he says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have come to call the righteous. Uh, to, to call the, to not, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And so he came for you and me. In fact, I want to go back to the announcement from the angel here in verse 10. Look at what the angel says. The angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. He says, I have this news that's going to cause great joy for all the people, for everyone. That includes you. And so when Jesus comes as the Messiah, he's coming for you. Jesus was born in Bethlehem so that he could set us free from sin, so that he could be our Messiah, and so we need to be amazed. And then I want to wrap up with this. Let's be amazed that Jesus is the Lord. This is what the angel tells us in his announcement, verses 10 and 11, one more time. Look at what the angel says. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. He is the Lord. In other words, He is the ruler of this world and your life. I mean, this is what it means for the angel to say that Jesus is the Lord. Look what Daniel says about Jesus. He says, He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. That's a good piece of word for us right there this morning. There is no king. There is no ruler. There is no power that can go up against Jesus and win because he is the Lord. He is the ruler over all creation and he's the ruler of our lives. I mean, think about this for just a second, okay? Jesus has always been Lord and Jesus is Lord and Jesus will always be Lord. The Hebrews writer says, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. He sustains all things by his powerful word. It's not that all things sustain Jesus, but that he sustains all things. He is the Lord. He's the ruler over creation, and he is the ruler in our lives. And so what this means, listen to me, because I think this is really important, especially in, in the culture that we're living in today. But what this means is that the world does not have the final say on what is right and what is wrong. The world does not have the final say on whether you're successful or unsuccessful. The world does not have the final say on how you live your life. But he is the Lord, and so he has the final say. You know, it was 37 years ago last Sunday, December 18th, 1985, when I made the decision to give my heart and life to Jesus. And when I made that decision that I was going to live for him, that I was no longer going to live for myself, but I was going to live for him, that I wanted him to be my savior, right? I wanted him to rescue me and save me from my sins. I wanted him to be the Messiah. I wanted him to set me free from the power and the penalty and the punishment of my sin. 
And so when I made this decision to give my heart and life to Jesus, I wasn't making him the Lord of my life. He's always been the Lord, right? And so when we make this decision to follow Jesus, we, we're not making him the Lord of our lives. We're just submitting to his lordship. We're surrendering to his lordship. We're yielding to his control. Life is no longer about me, but now it's all about him. It's all about Jesus. And so if he is the Lord of my life, and if he is the Lord of your life, then when Jesus says to love one another, we love one another. When Jesus says to be generous, we live with generosity. When Jesus says to build each other up, we build each other up. When Jesus says to have faith, we have faith. When Jesus says not to worry, we shouldn't worry. When Jesus says to pray for those who persecute us, we pray. When Jesus says not to judge, we shouldn't judge. When Jesus tells us to forgive, we forgive. When Jesus gives us this guide to resolve conflict, we should follow this guide. When Jesus says to deny ourselves every day and to follow him, we should deny ourselves. I mean, you get the picture, right? This really isn't about a choice. This really isn't about choosing whether or not we want to make him the Lord of, of our lives. He is already Lord. This is about submitting to his lordship. This is about surrendering to his lordship. And rather than that surrender being a burden, we ought to be amazed. We ought to be amazed that he is the Lord of our lives. And so friends, listen to me. It's not about how many Christmas lights you use to decorate your house. Today in the town of David, a savior, one who saves you, one who rescues you from your sin. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. He's the one who sets you free. He's the one who sets you free from the penalty and the power and the punishment of your sins. He is the Messiah, the Lord. He is the ruler. He is the ruler of our lives. And we surrender and we submit. Friends, he is the good news of great joy. And this morning, let's just be amazed. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father, for Jesus. <clears throat> and Father, as we go through the rest of this day with family, with friends, may we just focus on the true meaning of Christmas. May we not lose that true meaning this morning, this afternoon, this evening. But Father, may we be amazed as we go through today. May we be amazed that he is our Savior, that he is the Messiah, that he's the Lord. We thank you, Father, that eternal life is found in him. We thank you for the clarity of your word. And we're grateful, Father, for your love. We're grateful that you've sent Jesus to give his life on the cross for us. Father, may we continue to worship you. May we continue to just lift our hearts before you in praise. May we just pour out ourselves in these next few moments as we worship you for who you are. We worship you because of your love and goodness. We worship you because of what you've done for us in Jesus. And we pray these things in his name. Amen.